Welcome to the Bridging Connections podcast. This podcast will introduce you to the people who are on the cutting edge of Jewish innovation. You will be hearing from founders and directors of contemporary organizations creating new paths to participate in Jewish life. In this podcast, you will learn about best practices, tips for engagement, and how to create meaningful connections. This is a place that will bridge you to the tools and resources used by the Jewish leaders, visionaries, and innovators that are creating a new sustainable Judaism. I'm your host, Elizabeth Gossage, and I welcome you to come bridge the gap with me. Today's episode spotlights Silver Screen Studios and its co-founder, Tiffany Wolf. Tiffany, who lost both of her parents at a young age, looks to the older generation as guides for living well. Silver Screen Studios is a growing series of short documentaries. They have interviewed legendary seniors like Marianne Ross, the iconic mom from Happy Days, and the late broadcaster, Larry King. The studio's films spotlight both the legends we love and the everyday stars in our own lives. These films tell the stories of those living well in their later years and show us how to live life fully. They are our role models for living a great last act of our own lives. These short documentaries show that we can learn about the past from the people who have lived it. This passion project for Tiffany started three years ago and has taken off during the pandemic. They now have three published series and continue to roll out more. My biggest takeaway from today's podcast is that everyone has a story to tell. We have the tools to capture these stories and keep them alive. I hope my conversation with Tiffany inspires you to document the lives of your own loved ones. Hi, Tiffany. So excited that you're recording with me today. It's fun how I met you. I was having a conversation with David Katznelson, of course, of Reboot, and I hadn't heard of Silver Screen Studio. And he said, oh, you have to meet Tiffany. I am going to write an email as soon as we're done talking and get you hooked up with her. And so, of course, as soon as he did that, I got on the internet and looked up Silver Screen Studio and got very excited to meet you. So this is fun because I'm feeling very passionate about what you're doing to the point that I've been sending different film clips to my mother and even to my mother-in-law. Oh, you've got to hear this one and you've got to hear this one. And they're enjoying it too. So tell me, what drew you to creating Silver Screen Studio? Oh, well, first off, thank you for having me on your show. Um, And I just want to mention David Katz Nelson is one of the most amazing people. If you're lucky to know him, he's a great connector and everyone he's introduced me to, I've had uh, the good fortune of meeting. So if you know David Katz Nelson or you don't know him, he's a great person to me. (laughs) And he's part of the story of Silver Stream Studios. So um, I've always had, I kind of start from the beginning. Um, I've always had an affinity for the older generation. Uh, In college, I worked in a nursing home. Uh, I ran the bingo (laughs) at a nursing home out of Boston. And um, it's just always been a cohort that I felt very comfortable with and wanted to capture their stories. And then my parents died relatively young in their 60s. And um, I realized as I've gotten older and uh, had different milestones in my life that I didn't have the the role models um, on how to live a great last act of your life and how to be a well-lived 85-year-old. I don't unfortunately have that with my parents or my grandparents who uh, passed away. And I started thinking about, well, how can I turn my passion to talking with older people from, you know, meeting someone at Starbucks to bringing them home, you know, making friends with older people and just befriending people. How can I take it a step further and capture their stories? So my first thought was, you know, I wanted to go to Reboot, which is a um, Jewish media arts organization, a uh, nonprofit that David Katznelson, as we mentioned, is the, the head of Reboot. And, and really Silver Screen Studios is under, you know, they reboots the producers of Silver. So we kind of fall under the umbrella of the different projects uh, that they're doing to try to make Judaism more meaningful and more interesting in the 21st century. 
for younger audiences. Um, so I'm part of Reboot and I went to Dave and I said, you know, I've been thinking a lot about how can I take this passion project that I have, my day job, I do public relations, I do entertainment and film PR. Um, but I said, I'd love to just go and capture stories of our Jewish elders and talk to them um, and create little films about them to celebrate their lives and, and to shine a spotlight on them. And uh, fortunately, they were very um, supportive. And uh, I brought in my friend, a fellow rebooter named Steve Goldblum, who is uh, a producer for PBS NewsHour. And he also has a strong affinity for the older generation. Um, he had made a film with Rita Moreno and one of his most watched uh, segments of PBS NewsHour was about a woman named Flossie Lewis about getting older. So he seemed like the perfect partner for this. And together with Reboot's help, we headed down to LA. And I just started doing a lot of research in kind of the Jewish space of who were the leaders around aging. And, you know, what are some of the rituals or the concepts around Judaism and aging? And I was fortunate enough to be put in touch with Rabbi Laura Geller who started a Chai village, which is a community where the congregation age in place. They stay at home and the services come to them and they have this very robust community. So uh, our first film shoot was, uh, was at the temple with extraordinary congregants that came together just to talk about living well. Um, we're all living longer, but how do we live better? Learning about some of the Jewish concepts like the Jewish living will and things of storytelling and community and how we can kind of keep those stories going. Because, you know, obviously being Jewish, we always look back to look forward. So that's what kicked it off. And then I thought, okay, well, let's take it a step further. And um, maybe if we could get some celebrities involved, maybe that would bring more uh, attention to the series and uh, inspire others to call their older loved ones and record them. And so Marion Ross, Mrs. C from Happy Days, she happens to be my godmother. Um, I know she's everybody's TV's favorite mom, but um, my parents were very close with her. When my mom passed away, she's become like a surrogate mother to me. Um, oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, she's incredible. And in her film, the first uh, show we kicked off was called The Last Act. And everyone loved the show, but didn't really like the name. I like the name, but... <laughs> <laughs> when we started to film in like nursing homes, people said, you know, can we change the name? Cause it's a little, you know, like, Hey, this is your last rights or something. Right. I could see that. Yeah. I could see how they feel that way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we interviewed Marion um, and we interviewed uh, Norman Lear, who is uh, my heroes. And then we just started to get a lot of interest, which was incredible. So we ended up going to Detroit um, and we got a generous grant in Detroit to interview some luminaries uh, there. And um, we created another series called Coming of Age. And we were in LA and Detroit and other areas traveling the country, interviewing these incredible from Holocaust survivors to Senator Carl Levin to uh, just really folks with everyday people, but with really compelling stories to luminaries in the community. So we were in the middle of finishing the production and then of course COVID hit. And uh, our first thought was, gosh, you know, we just had these beautiful experiences interviewing older loved ones. And that's, you know, it's such a shame that we can't continue or what are we gonna do with this? Cause we were gonna submit it to festivals. We had long-term plans for how to release these films. But then my partner, Noam Dromi, who is the head of Reboot Studios and kind of the person that's taken my little idea to a whole other level that it's eligible for an Emmys. And, you know, he's really taken my idea to a whole other stage of this. Um, we thought, you know what, with COVID happening and that our elders are the most compromised, the most isolated right now, the most uh, marginalized, yet they have the most incredible stories to tell about resiliency. They have the history, the experience, how to get through wars, how to get through famine, how to get through so many things that our generation, this is for many, the first kind of hard hit experience we've had. So we thought, you know what, let's get these films out now. We want people to hear from Risa Egofeld, a 102 year old Holocaust survivor who talks about following the blessings no matter what. I mean, there were just so many beautiful nuggets of stories that we thought we got to get them out now. 
So we actually released Coming of Age online just so people could enjoy it during this time. And let me back up so I can try to understand the timeline. Yeah. So when you first started doing these recordings and the last act and these things, how long ago was that? So that was about, we launched three years ago. Okay. So when you did those, you released the recordings right away or you held on to them or? Yeah, we released the last act in May, 2018. Okay. Uh, and then we, uh, we were working with a local nursing home here called um, the Campus for Jewish Living in San Francisco. Okay. Um, and we were doing more partnership kinds of projects. And then we, about a year later, got more funding to continue on this kind of high production value level traveling the country. And that's where we created Coming of Age. Okay. In summer 2019. Okay. Yeah. So you created it, you had the material. Yeah. So then the pandemic was sort of the impetus to get that out. Right. Okay. And when we got Coming of Age out, even though it was, you know, earlier than we thought, we just said, let's get them out. Then we thought, well, what do we do now during this time? How do we capture these stories during COVID? Yeah. And that's when we decided, let's just um, get on Zoom. Let's get on the digital tools that we have and just start calling our older loved ones and checking in with them and uh, capturing their stories the best way we can. And I think what we learned is there's no perfection right now. It's a very um, forgiving time for that. And it makes things a little bit more authentic and interesting. So my first phone call, and again, we thought, well, let's see if we can get some celebrities to do this. And my first phone call was Larry King, which I don't know if you know, but he just got out of the ICU with COVID. I didn't know that. Wow. Thank God he's out and survived it. Oh, yes. That's a blessing. Which I talked with his best dear friend, Herbie Cohen, who wrote the book, You Can Negotiate Anything. He's amazing. I called to check in on Larry and he said, you know, that man has had every disease known to man. He had to get a new one. <laughs> And you know what? He pulled through, thank God. And he's a very resilient man. Such a blessing. So Larry King was very close friends with my father. Uh, my father was Bob Wolf, a prominent um, sports and entertainment attorney. And he started sports law. So he started athlete representation. So the joke was when you called his office, it was either Larry King or Larry Bird because he had all different kinds of clients. Um, and it was a very interesting life growing up with athletes and a lot of tall athletes living in bunk beds down in the basement or um, they became like family to us. So Larry was another- That was fun. Yeah, it was fun. A lot of people wanted to come to our house for dinner. Let's say that. <laughs> um, and Larry ended up living, moved, buying the house next door to us, um, Larry Bird. But Larry King, uh, my dad started negotiating his contracts when he started with CNN. He's negotiated his contract for CNN and they became best friends. And uh, when my father died, when he was 65, uh, Larry, among many other people, spoke at the funeral. And that was the last time I spoke to Larry. And I picked up the phone, what, six months ago, eight months ago, said, hey, Larry, it's Tiffany Wolf calling. And he's Bob Wolf starter. And he said, how you doing? It was like no time had passed. <laughs> Those are the best relationships when they're seamless like that. It was beautiful. So I said, I have this idea to do this little series to interview kind of the legends we love and check in on them in COVID. He said, you want to talk now? I said, no, no, I need to make some arrangements. I'll call you <laughs> later in the week. And he was gracious enough to do it. The sweetest part is he just wanted to talk about how much he missed my dad and how much he loved my dad. It was so sweet. And I'm such a beautiful tribute to your father. I know. I'm so lucky to have that because I don't have the opportunity to speak to my parents, but at least to, to speak to people that love them and knew them. And it's nice. So Larry kicked it off for us. And then um, we spoke to Tommy Chong uh, from Cheech and Chong and Ellen Burstyn, who's incredible. Uh, Norman Lear, Mr. Lear did another show for us, uh, Marion, and then um, Carl Reiner agreed to do an interview and he was a complete cold call, which is, I literally looked up his manager's number on IMDB, called the number thinking there's no way anyone's going to answer. Someone answered. <laughs> And I said, I know this is a long shot, but my name's Tiffany. I have this little show called uh, Dispatches from Quarantine. That's what the name of the show. I remember Dispatches from Quarantine. I remember Reboot kind of promoting that. So I remember that. That's right. the name of the series that right. we decided to kick off during COVID. And um, the woman was gracious enough to give me um, Mr. Reiner's assistance email. And within a few days, we got a note back saying Mr. Reiner would love to do it. And we 
almost fell off our chairs. It was like a bucket list moment. I have chills just hearing you recount this. Oh, it was really, really amazing. And he's Carl Reiner, a comic legend. And the thing that was so incredible, and, and everyone knows this too, is what a kind, kind man. So we get on Zoom and I have, um, I have boys 10 and 11, or actually they're going to be 11 and 12, but I have young boys. And whenever I would do an interview, I would just have them meet the kids because what are the odds of them meeting Carl Reiner? Right. And he was so sweet with them. It was a moment that, you know, like the fact that I have that little moment on our little Zoom recording is just so sweet. He said, what a handsome bunch of fellas you are. <laughs> I love the movement of the generation. So your parents provided opportunities for you to meet great legends. And now you've in turn done that for your own children, which is a beautiful nod to your upbringing. I love that. That's a really astute and kind thing to say. Thank you. I never thought of that. Thank you. It's really cool. So we did the interview with Mr. Reiner and um, my director and I guess you would call him my consigliere gnome on the series is an archival footage wizard. And Mr. Reiner had told a joke that how he got into comedy, he used to listen to this radio show with his brother. He starts to tell this joke about a guy where you pull his tooth. He's the most stubborn man in the world. You pull his tooth, you pull the other tooth. And he's telling this great joke, um, but he said the wrong radio show. But Gnome found the footage and he was blown away. How did he find the audio of this joke? Oh, wow. From this old radio show that Carl Reiner listened to as a child. It's amazing. Um, so Mr. Reiner seemed to love the segment and uh, what we heard, and we don't know if it's true or not, but we're going to say it is true because it just would be a great story, is that Mr. Reiner and um, Mel Brooks, after their Jeopardy and uh, having dinner with their TV trays, they watched the segment together and they loved it. And then a few days later, uh, Mr. Reiner uh, tweeted about it, which was incredible because he enjoyed it so much. And he passed away six days later. It's a beautiful tribute to his life. You were able to recap his life right towards the end. Yes. And I woke up and I heard Mr. Reiner died. I thought, oh my God. And I Googled it in Time Magazine and Vanity Fair and all this press saying, watch Carl Reiner's final interview. And it was our interview. We didn't know. That's amazing. And we thought, wow, what a privilege and honor um, to be his last interview. And, he, and people said it was almost like a living eulogy. You know, he really wanted to talk and really get out his life story. And we just happened to be the conduits, the lucky recipients of it. So it really ties into another project of Reboot, which is Death Over Dinner. Oh, yes. Yeah. Because one of the things you do, and I don't know if you attended a Death Over Dinner event. I have. So I've gone to several Death Over Dinners. In fact, I've facilitated some. And one of the things you often do is talk about what you'd want to have said in your eulogy. Yeah. It is a living yes. eulogy in a sense. So it's so interesting how that relates and the two projects come together in that way. I was thinking the other night about my own passing because uh, I don't know if you know Shoshana Unger leader. She's another rebooter and she started something called the End Well Conference. And it's about death and dying with humanity and talking about things that are uncomfortable now and I think with COVID, we all realize time is of the essence to capture stories, talk about uncomfortable things that we, this maybe is the year of kind of learning that, you know, but I was thinking for myself, I would love to do a living eulogy and I would love for people to be celebrated as we do when they pass, but before they pass. So of course, it's never too soon to celebrate someone's life. That's so true. And I think Mr. Reiner's story and, you know, the piece went viral and people really loved it. And we were so blessed for people, for the outreach and the, the accolades, I guess you could say. But it really did hit that home of like, you know, capture the stories before it's too late. You know, capture your loved one's stories, call them, record them. Even like I said, even if it's not perfect, it doesn't have to be precious. But um, what I would give to be able to do that with my parents right now. And if I can in any way be someone that connects that idea for other people to do it, then I feel like my work is worth it. You know, it's worthwhile. That actually really leads into the question I had in my mind about all of this. 
if someone says, well, I think my parents have an amazing story. What do you do? Do you encourage them? Do you have like a set of um, interview questions that you would send to them? Or do you encourage them to get on a call with you? Or how do you go about encouraging this kind of format? Well, I'm very glad you asked because we have uh, different ways we do it. Um, you know, we do have a set of uh, tool quick kit questions. So, you know, a DIY, if you want to do it on, on your own and just call your mom, call your grandmother, here's some questions to ask them. Tell us about where you were raised. Tell us about your family, you know, those kinds of things To What are you grateful for? What's the legacy you want to leave behind? Um, we have a toolkit, which I can share with you if you want to share online. I'll definitely share that in the show notes. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, we also, if folks want to take it to another level and create a film, that's something you would see on A&E or something you don't have to be Larry King or Carl Reiner. You can be, everyone has a great story to tell. So of course we um, we have a production team that creates when people are interested you know to hire us to create this type of formatted film about their loved ones with archival footage and um, interviews and something that you can have as a time capsule for generations to come. Very very cool. So in other words, it's like a package that someone can purchase from you. Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, and you know thankfully. Um, I didn't realize, but they're really, people are responding. So we're doing a lot of films coming up in the next uh, couple months. And we have, uh, we're always open to new stories, but I'm thrilled that there's actually a need for it too. So it's as if you're becoming digital biographers and digital historians, correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And um, I don't know if you had seen what we did around Sukkot with the Holocaust Museum, or if you want me to I don't know anything about that, but I knew that you did a project with the Holocaust Museum. I have a friend that actually works for the Holocaust Museum in LA. Oh, who? So you may have met her. Marissa? Yeah. Yeah. Marissa and I studied together at Spurtis oh. for our master's in Jewish professional studies. Wow. Oh, how funny. Okay. So shout out to Marissa. I know she listens to the podcast. Oh, perfect. And to answer the whole team there, Beth Keen's amazing. Um, Jordana, it was a great partnership. Um, so basically, um, through the work of an organization called Canvas, which is uh, run by Lou Cove, who used to be the head of Reboot, all, all roads seem to lead back to Reboot. He came up with this incredible idea with um, KJM, the Council of Jewish Museums, that around the Sukkah holiday, to create these public art installations to express how do you celebrate Sukkot during this time under COVID, under unrest, social justice, kind of capturing those issues during this very particularly hard year. So we worked with the Holocaust Museum LA and we um, created this public art installation right outside of the museum called the Ushpizen of the Silver Screen. And Ushpizen is the spiritual guest that we welcome into our Yes, Exactly as you were explaining it, the word Ushpizen came to my head because of course we honor our ancestors yes. into the sukkah with us. So why not honor the work you're doing? Exactly. Yeah, that's amazing. So we created this old time Hollywood era of the golden age film complex that was unbelievable. I mean, I worked with our production designer, if I can give a shout out to John Lane, was incredible. I mean, this thing, you could live in it. You know, it was unbelievable. So it looked like an old style movie theater, but it had the, you know, the, the branches on top. And we had a popcorn machine filled with lemons. And we had all these great little nods to Sukkot. And there was one old Hollywood style movie theater chair to show kind of, this was for the Ushpizen, spiritual guests but also to show our isolation this year and to show that we're kind of on our screens right now to get any kind of connection. And we had a movie screen showing the films and we interspersed it with some of the um, museum's Holocaust survivor films. And it was, I feel so proud to be a part of it. it um, people were really happy to have some kind of somewhere to go to get some culture that's not just online. So there was a lot of in-person visitors to it. Um, but it was another example of um, trying to get the word out there to capture the stories. Will that display be going on the road at some point for other cities? We would love that. Um, you know, that it's exactly, I think that's the next step trying to figure out how do you keep this going? Because it was only up during for the week and people really wanted more of it, which is, was great. 
So, well, I want to come see it and I'm quite far from California. So, you know, just out of my own right, right. personal interest, let's get it here to Chicago and around the country. We'd love to. It was a really cool thing to work on. So I guess one of the things I'd love to say is that I had an idea that I wanted to talk to older people and capture their stories um, in a, some format. Little did I know three years later, you know, that it would, we would have three series happening under the Silver Screen Studios platform, that we would have this public art installations happening, that we would be having this ongoing audience and, and a need for people to want to do this project with us to capture their family's stories. I just feel so blessed because if I could, um, I would just talk to older people all day long. It's, there's just a moment of grace with every interview that I think, God, how did I get so lucky? How do I get to be the person that's listening to this? And God, I got to share it. I have to share these words of wisdom. And usually a lot of it comes from, again, those questions, what are you grateful for? What's your legacy? Um, what do you want people to know about you? And I think with COVID, it's a very authentic time that people really open up maybe in a way that they wouldn't have in other times of our lives. Isn't it funny that a time when we are asked to stay in, you're equating with a time that people are opening up. Mm. I think that is interesting that when you're forced to stay in, you tend to come out in a different way. Absolutely. I mean, if you're lucky enough, this is really is a time of going inward, right? To think differently about your outer life, I guess, you know, um, yeah. and this series really, I mean, I'm just grateful that I've had kind of a purpose and hopefully, um, and some meaning to all of this moment that gosh, if people call their grandmother because of seeing Carl Reiner, or if people record their aunt or just even people say hello, you know, whenever I'm out walking, even with the mask, I always wave at older people, you know, I just, they're so isolated but you know what? They're okay. Like they're okay. We have a lot to learn from them. Something you said in the beginning, you said that they have so much resilience and that's a huge lesson that we can learn. Oh yeah. You know, every person I've talked to, there's no uh, victimhood or, I mean, every story, whether it's someone very famous or someone every day with an incredible story to tell, which is all of us. It's, I think the bottom line that I'm learning from our older generation is if, if you always Follow the blessings, as Risa Eaglefield said at 103. Follow the blessings. As Carl Reiner said, always have something to do. Always have something you're, be curious. I mean, at 85, 90, 100, to stay passionate and curious at that age, I think that we could probably do that too at our age. Those are such huge lessons mm -hmm. that need to be taught from the youngest person, child on up. And, and not just taught, but reiterated so that we don't forget. Because when we forget those things, that's when despair comes in. Mm -hmm. And that's when you say, oh, woe is me. I'm stuck in the house and I'm not seeing anyone and I'm bored or I'm lonely. But if you're counting your blessings and you're curious, so you're learning, it gives you reason and hope. Absolutely. And that's another thing that uh, I think Ellen Burstyn said, there was that uh, and kind of the sentiment of all of them is every day is a choice. Like you have to wake up and make a conscious effort to say, okay, how am I going to live this day intentionally? How am I going to show up for this day? And when you're 95, each day is pretty precious. And during COVID, each day is pretty precious, we're learning. So maybe that's a lesson that will uh, resonate beyond this pandemic. It's a beautiful lesson. I love it. And I do hope it resonates beyond the, the pandemic. So tell me, you know, we we're talking about this being a Jewish organization and I had a question. Are all the interviews with Jewish people? No, no, no. And that's okay. I was just curious and just want the audience to know too. Absolutely. We would love to interview everybody. Um, I think that we started, of course, with Jewish role models because we kind of started with, you know, our community. Right. But we would be thrilled to interview, you know, we want to make it as diverse as possible. I love that too. And I mean, that is a value of our community to begin with is, is be inclusive and to have diversity in the Jewish community as well. So yeah, I love that. But let's get back to talking a little bit about the Jewish community and just your forecast and how you feel about the Jewish community in terms of what you think its greatest needs are and what your vision for the Jewish community going forward. 
Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, when the Jewish community comes together to create things, it's, it's always, there's some pretty amazing things to come out of it. I mean, culturally, artistically, social justice wise, you know, even working on this project with Canvas, the outdoor public art installation, it's amazing what the Jewish cultural arts world can do right now under the confines of COVID. As far as the Jewish community, my hope personally is that, you know, there is still anti-Semitism out there and um, even more online, even more, you know, with COVID where people are online and there's trolls and their people are, are just saying awful things behind their uh, screens. And wow, that really hurts. I mean, that's, yeah, that's my wish for the Jewish community is that we always continue to look back um, and that's part of this project to look forward and to capture stories of people and survivors and people that can show what a full life really means and to be proud of your Jewish heritage and be proud of your community and to be proud of it out loud, you know, online uh, for younger generations like Hillel and things like that. I think it's a really important time to dig into your roots in that way and celebrate your humanity and your religion at this really kind of crucial time for that. Beautiful. Thank you. That's so well said. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm so grateful to have this conversation with you. Um, as an educator, I've always been an educator of young children and some adults. So work in the elder community is not something I've done, although, you know, I, of course, I have parents that are elder and family members. Um, and I know I've always known there's great stories to be told. So I love that you're someone in this bringing out the stories for the rest of us. It's inspiring to me. And I can't wait to listen to more and see more of the films and see how you move forward with it, because it's definitely work that is giving honor and homage to the generation that won't be here forever. Right. And it seems so important to me. So it's exciting to hear you speak of it with so much passion. Thank you so much. And if I could just mention, you brought up a really good point. The whole intergenerational storytelling is something we really aspire to do more of. Um, having high school kids go into the nursing homes or even virtually right now to interview residents, having grandchildren interview their grandparents, really bridging that gap is what we aspire to do as well. Um, from having uh, younger generations who might not even have exposure to older generations, getting comfortable with them, asking them questions. One of the things I love about having kids interview older loved ones or, or older role models, it's not so much the end result of the film, but what you see they're both getting out of in the moment. It's pretty cool. Oh, because I think when you get face-to-face -face with someone, regardless of the age between you, and you're discussing real things, you learn a respect, you learn commonalities that you didn't realize you had. So that I can imagine that younger children or younger people and older people getting together have this light bulb moment of, oh, wow, this old person likes some of the same things I like, or, you know, we have these things in common and it makes our world, our humanity so much smaller when we realize how similar we are along with our differences. Absolutely. And lastly, I'll say to that point is that, um, and I'm sure you know this, uh, I'm probably repeating something you know very well, but that kids that know more about their families and their roots and their history are just have a little bit more of a sound balance to them or harmony, knowing that where they came from. Um, so it's always good to open up that kind of family tree or your roots to make kids feel more grounded. It's true. I'm glad that you're leaving us with that. So um, I'm going to say goodbye and thank you so much for being on the podcast. And I hope to hear more from you. And I'm excited to showcase silver screens on bridges and put all these great links in the show notes if anyone wants to revisit things um, and just say thank you so much, Tiffany. Oh, Elizabeth, this was such a pleasure. And um, thank you for having me and shining a light on our series and our work, and uh, it's greatly appreciated. Oh, well, it's likewise. Thank you for tuning in to the Bridging Connections podcast. This podcast and Bridges 613 will succeed if its social media reach is wide. Please partner with us to promote this important work. 
You can follow us on Facebook at Bridges613 and visit our website at www.bridges613.org. There, you can read blogs, listen to past podcasts, and subscribe to our newsletter. Please share the podcast and our social media links with your community and enable others to benefit and learn about the groundbreaking innovation taking place in our beloved Jewish community. Your support is greatly appreciated.